So let's take a pause there if you're okay with that. Okay, sure, Chris. Um, it's a fascinating um, presentation so far. Thank you very much. Would love to, re to, to hear about the transportation, but let's see first if we have any questions. Sounds good. Any questions about energy, buildings, um, Alexis? Can you can you come and hear just so that your sound is crystal clear? Yeah, I might not be able to hear her from that far. Yeah. So, um, Alexis Roomsmith, she has a question. Um, for the floating solar, are you seeing any effects on the water temperature of the water bodies you're putting it into? We are not seeing uh, effects um, that are that are measurable from a water temperature standpoint at all. Um, and what, what we have seen is a reduction in eutrophication, uh, algae blooms as a result, because some of the pond, some of the, obviously the pond is now being covered by those panels and therefore minimizes the amount of sunlight that's hitting them and uh, maximizing the algae growth. Um, you know, one of the part of the research that we have with NREL going on now is uh, one is what is the efficiency gains that we can see from floating solar? Because if you know, you know, water has a high specific heat, it buffers temperature changes better than land. And so because of that, and Florida being so warm and hot, um, you know, the, the hypothesis is that we may see, um, percent, you know, increases in efficiency uh, on floating solar versus on rooftops or carports because of the temperature. Now, it's counterintuitive, but the hotter a solar panel gets, the less efficient it actually gets, the less output. Uh, and so that's why, you know, you, you see comparisons of Colorado's production sometimes, although they are higher in latitude, they often also are cooler. And, and so a cooling effect improves the efficiency of solar photovoltaics. And so we're, we, you know, the hypothesis is we may see some, you know, percentage increases as a result. That's part of the research being done. The other part is what are the aquatic impacts? Is there any leaching coming from the racking system? By the way, the, the, the floats are essentially like boat docks, like, uh, like jet ski docks, you know, the same type of material, that polymer plastic that floats. And um, it's basically manufactured to land solar panels on them at the perfect tilt. So it's at a 22 to 25 degree tilt. And, it just, and the other cool thing about floating solar is it allows more density of solar panels because you have the lack of shading, you know, in a solar farm, you actually have to have, you know, several feet between each row of solar panels because of the shading that, that it provides. But because of the low profile of floating solar, you can actually put a megawatt of floating solar in about an acre and a half to two acres versus four to five acres with a ground mounted system. So, so it's actually showing that there's more density. The last thing I'll say about floating solar is we researched how many ponds we have in Orlando. And in, or I will say in Orange County, there's about 6,000 ponds in Orlando. These are not man, these are not spring fed natural lakes. These are man made holes that we create when we're building impervious pavement and, and surfaces. We have to make that stormwater go somewhere. So these are man made holes that don't have a lot of value other than holding a lot of this excess rainwater. And so we see this as a real unique application for our region and uh, NREL has a whole study even showing that 10% of the United States could be met off of floating solar. Um, and that's with registered water bodies, which retention ponds are not registered water bodies. So they're just talking about public water, uh, you know, drinking basins and uh, things of that nature. Thank you, Chris. Sure. Very promising. Thanks, Chris. Any other questions? So Henry. Hello, Chris. Uh, I just had questions. If you guys are cooperating with any cities around the area and how you guys will work together. Excellent question. Yes, we are most definitely. You know, Orlando is kind of the tip of the spear for this type of work in the state and let alone in the southeast region. But we're part of several networks, peer networks of cities. One's called the Urban Sustainability Directors Network. USDN. This is a peer network across the entire country. It's actually North America, so it includes Canada. Uh, and, and there's now over 500 cities that are participating as members of that network. And it's, it's amazing. I'm on working groups every week of a different topic, whether it's vehicle electrification, whether it's equity and energy, you know, all of these topics. And so we're working together to solve this stuff together. 
in Florida, we have a subgroup of USDN called Florida Sustainability Directors Network, FSDN. And, and FSDN is now about 40 members strong. And a lot of the members are here in Central Florida. Uh, the last network I wanna mention to you that's, that's really unique and new is um, the Central Florida Regional Planning Council has created a new collaborative called the Regional Resilience Collaborative, R2C for short, you can Google this. And that collaborative is made up of eight counties in East Central Florida, including Volusia, Brevard, Osceola, Orange, Seminole, Lake, Sumner, Marion, I think those are the eight. Um, and so those eight counties are part of this regional collaborative. And that regional collaborative is working on a greenhouse gas inventory for the whole region. We're developing a strategic plan for different policy strategies that we can work together on in the region. And so we are definitely working closely, um, especially there in Volusia County. We have Katrina Locke, who's at Volusia County's Sustainability Department, um, and, and many of the other cities within those counties who are participating actively. So there, there is some work happening, a lot of work happening, actually. Very cool. Well, thank you. Of course. Thanks, Chris. Any other questions from students here or online? Any questions online? Actually, I have a question that's related. Sure. Um, so if you compare the city of Orlando to other cities in the US or worldwide, where do we actually stand right now? There's a couple of indexes out there that have you know global indexes and we stand in the top 20 uh, from Siemens's Green, Ener Green Cities report. There is, um, there's also essentially a new report that just came out by ESI Thought Labs about the alignment of both SDGs and smart cities work. And we ranked in the top five uh, for, for cities uh, in, in the United States that are working uh, towards advancing both of those efforts together. Um, so coined this as kind of a city 4.0, which is a new type of, of city that they're, they're now trying to define. And we happen to be in that upper echelon. I think one of the things that separates Orlando is one, we have a very strong culture of collaboration. Our partnership with the utility and transit authority and universities is unlike I've ever seen in any of my friends as cities around the country. Our ability to, and I think a big reason for that is because we're all trying to, we're all trying to redefine Orlando's future, right? We've been kind of in the shadows of the theme parks for so long. And there's just this robust culture of Orlando that a lot of people don't get to witness. In fact, we have this whole slogan, Orlando, you don't know the half of it. And that's like our economic development slogan to, to attract people to Orlando, because quite frankly, you come in, you go to the theme parks, you leave, you don't even get to witness the incredible stuff that's happening in our neighborhoods and our downtowns and the arts and culture and the food scene here is amazing and growing uh, and all the sustainability stuff. So, you know, part of that uh, you know, challenge is that now people are kind of gravitating towards working together to try to redefine Orlando in this light of innovation, sustainability, future ready, like we want to be that city of the future. And um, that's been really useful in helping to mobilize action around these topics. And I think um, that's something important so if to you know. you were curious, what, it, what are the other five or the other four on the top of the list? Um, I'll have to go back and remember, but I know that, you know, so New York, DC, LA, Boston, uh, Chicago, Atlanta, Austin, St. Louis, um, Columbus, these cities, you know, th there's amazing work happening in cities all around the country. Whether it's um, comprehensive or just deep in one strategy is, I think, what sets us apart from others because we're very comprehensive in our approach. Uh, some cities are just really deep in transportation or they might be really heavy in buildings, but they're not you know, moving on local food or zero waste. And so when you look at our approach in Orlando and the reason why we're ranked so high is, you know, quite frankly, because of how we approach it. The last thing I'll say is that um, you might have heard of LEED certification, right? We've talked about that for buildings. Well, LEED has a whole cities and communities certification now. So they actually certify an entire city or an entire community or a neighborhood. And we just went through that process and we ranked lead gold. Uh, we were the first lead gold city in the Southeast United States. Uh, and it's one of the highest levels of sustainability performance. So that's a third party verified and vetted certification on, on Orlando. 
Yeah, so if we don't have any questions, actually, we're now very excited to hear about transportation. So maybe the quickly go through the last 10 minutes or so. OK, cool. So transportation, you know, you know, as I talked about before, reduction of vehicle miles traveled and getting people into out of their single occupancy vehicle into alternative forms of transportation is key. And it is so critical to a sustainable city. Uh, and so we've done a lot to expand bike and pedestrian paths. We have a, an entire bike highway that's currently being built in Orlando that will connect a, a, a um, you know, protected bikeway around all of downtown. It's eight and a half miles, and it connects to all these other trails that go east and west into the city. Uh, and so we're excited to, to really be supporting more bike and ped infrastructure. We also have e-bikes in downtown and electric scooters uh, for, for ride share. Uh, we have uh, a downtown limo, the bus rapid transit system, which I'll get into, and even autonomous uh, electric shuttles that are operating in Orlando. The one in the top left there is uh, uh, Lake Nona's autonomous electric shuttle that moves you from downtown uh, or kind of the city center of Lake Nona all the way to the neighborhood center. Uh, and, and it's a free service that's provided, you know, every single hour of the day. So we're starting to move even into, you know, some, some exciting transportation technologies. Now, e-mobility and electric vehicles are, are really important. It's important to know the why. One is from a public health standpoint, in Orlando, on-road vehicles contribute to 85% of carbon monoxide and 73% of nitrous oxide emissions, NOx emissions, which are directly contributing to public health and respiratory impacts. So this is a real issue that we're facing. Secondly, obviously we have a strong goal of, of reduction of carbon and hitting net zero by 2050, um, but on-road vehicles contribute about 20% of the problem. Uh, and so we need to really start to focus on that. And lastly, from an economic standpoint, um, the upfront cost of these electric vehicles are coming down drastically. The crossover point is supposed to be 2025 to 2026. We're gonna start to see actual you know, MSRP sticker value of an electric car equal to a comparative uh, regular ICE vehicle, you know, fossil fuel car, and the operating cost of electric vehicles are substantially lower. In Orlando, we've done the study on, you know, a Camry versus a plug-in uh, Bolt, and, you know, basically the same type of car for the same purpose. We're saving about $4,000 over the lifetime of the vehicle in the Chevy Bolt over the Camry because of the lack of, of, of wear and tear, the, the minimization of maintenance, there's very little maintenance, there's no oil changes, right? And the cost of electricity versus the gallon of gas is about less than a dollar per gallon equivalent for electricity. So out of the wall, it's about a dollar, little less than a dollar per gallon in Florida based on our rates versus 220 or 230, whatever the pump is out by you all. Um, and so it's you know literally less than 50% of the cost to just operate. So we've started to look at a whole you know, ecosystem of different types of strategies to move Orlando towards being more ready for electric vehicles. We have consumer rebates. We've been expanding charging. We have ride and drives for consumer education. We have our own fleet electrification of our city buses and, and cars. And then we're even exploring a code, an uh, electric vehicle building code that will require certain components of, of EVs. Uh, we started to project out Right now, we have about 5,500 electric vehicles registered in Orlando as of December of this past year. So 5,500 electric cars on the road. We are expected to get to above 12,000 electric cars by 2025. We're four years out, and we're supposed to more than double the amount of EVs on the road. It is something that we have to get ahead of. And the state of Florida has started to project out what the you know, vehicles might look like in 2030, 40, and 50. And, and so conservatively, we're looking at, you know, about 70% of on-road vehicles being electric by 2050. That's conservative. It may be even more than that. Uh, but we feel that 70% is probably a good estimate to start to build towards. So in the city fleet, I, I talked about, you know, moving towards electric. Here's a couple of examples. We even have electric motorcycles for the police department uh, to use for races and rallies and other pursuits. Uh, and so we have a small fleet of those. Every vehicle at the city uh, city hall for the motor pool, uh, basically, you know, any employee that needs to go out into the field, they're using an all electric, either Nissan Leaf or Chevy Bolt. Uh, and we even have a big purchase or an LOI to purchase about 100 electric trucks as those come out on the line in the next year. 
at OUC, we've done a number of programs around you get a, you get $200 of a rebate if you lease or purchase a new electric or plug-in hybrid vehicle. Um, we even have a dealership education program where car dealers can get uh, money. They can get actual financial incentives for selling EVs. And the incentive doesn't go to the car dealership. It goes to the sales rep, which we know is often uh, in, the, in the driver's seat, pun intended, to, sh to sell you certain vehicles. And if they start to move you towards electrics and there's an incentive behind it, then that's a win-win-win situation across the board. Uh, charging infrastructure has been pretty robust in Orlando. We have about 370 chargers, uh, individual ports or parking spaces for electric cars. And right now I'm adding another 100 electric chargers at city parks, rec centers, downtown parking garages, and other areas. And they're, they're gonna double both as public chargers, but also chargers for the city fleet vehicles as those you know, neighborhood centers and, and, and you know, employees in those centers start to transition their cars over as well. And then from a fast charging standpoint, this is a level three charger, um, DC fast charging, we call it. Uh, we are building the first and largest uh, DC fast charging hub in the state of Florida. It will be in the middle of downtown Orlando, right off of I-4, and people will be able to charge their cars in 30 minutes or less using these chargers that we're adding. Uh, this should be completed by fall, by October of this year. So pretty exciting movements. And then the last thing I think I have here is just the, the downtown bus system. We have a BRT, bus rapid transit. You can see the map there, and it goes not just in downtown, but also into surrounding neighborhoods. And our goal has been to move that bus system to 100% zero emission electric buses by 2025. Well, luckily over the last two years, we've landed two big federal grants and we now have 14 of the 20 electric buses operating at zero emission. So that's a little bit about our transportation work. Um, happy to take any, any questions about uh, that particu those particular efforts. That's just scratching the surface, quite frankly, on all those three. There is a lot more strategies that we're working on and, 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 and kind of implementing, but those give you an idea of how cities are beginning to look at you know, measuring their data around car their carbon footprint identifying where the biggest wedges are for us to focus on. And then here are some example strategies that we're implementing to begin to reduce those emissions and move our city in a healthier direction. And, and so, yeah, hopefully that helps demystify what we, what we do in cities. Thank you so much, Chris. This is really, um, you know, fantastic work and initiatives and really glad uh, to have had the chance to, uh, to see what's happening in the city of Orlando and, and, and to see that there's a progress in sustainability and resilience um, in, central Orla in central Florida. Uh, yes. So any questions regarding the transportation sector before? Um, I think we don't have any questions here. Anybody That's online? Okay. I know that was a lot of information. It was like drinking from a fire hose, so I, I get it. Um, I'm sure you're going to sync some of that in and questions might come up. If you do have any, feel free to email, email me and I'll, I'll try to get to you as, as quick as I possibly can. But just to leave you all with something, you know, it's so critical that you all are starting to think about sustainability and, and weave it into the curriculum. I very much appreciate that. Uh, you know, the future is ours to, to, to have and we're going to need every single person uh, in, in all sectors to really contribute towards moving us in the right direction. So the knowledge that you're taking away here, hopefully you can incorporate, not just in your studies, but as you move forward into your careers and uh, consider local government as, as a potential pathway. You know, when I was graduating from UCF, I would have never imagined uh, that, you know, 11 years later, I would be in the city of Orlando running, you know, running these, these types of efforts. Uh, it wasn't on my radar. It wasn't even a career path I was considering. Uh, and it just so happened that the mayor, mayor's office contacted me one day, said that they had heard of what I was doing and wanted to meet. And literally it snowballed. And I've been, I fell in love. I thought it was going to be a two year little consulting gig for the mayor. 
I've been here seven years and I'm in love with helping our communities move in the right direction and now working across the world in other cities uh, to replicate some of the work that we're doing here as well. So it's exciting. We got a good future ahead. We need everybody on board. Um, so hopefully that was inspiration. Yeah, definitely the work speaks louder than words, uh, as we saw today. And um, uh, I'll, I'll take this opportunity if any of the students have any questions or people online to actually email you. The email is at the bottom of, of the screen here. Uh, again, thank you very much for accepting to talk to us today. That was really fabulous. And hopefully you're gonna do this in future after COVID is all said and done. You'll come over here um, and uh, talk to us more in more details and hopefully sounds great by then, you for, there will be even more progress uh, I think so it's ongoing projects I think so thank you again for reaching out and, and the invitation thanks so much Chris thank you Chris uh, great presentation um, your passion is obvious and uh, I hope it translated to some of us and we will part, be part of this movement so I appreciate you doing this and again we will be in touch Pleasure. Keep up the great work. Yeah. Thanks, Chris. Bye bye, team. Talk to you later. Bye. Thank you. Bye, Dr. Gajori.